worried. You know, they're going to be next. Um, so one of his uh, aides comes up with the idea of, well, why don't we, uh, you know, start sending older people because they're about to die. Uh, you know, I'm going to start sending them. And, and the king thinks about it. And he says, I, I don't think that's a good idea because you know, there's a whole life story behind someone who's old. Um, why don't uh, you know, people are going to be very upset as they start to disappear. So then, then someone else comes up with the idea, uh, why don't we send babies? Because they've just come into life. They don't have a, a real life history. And, you know, people won't miss them. <laughs> well, I, I gather what happens is they start sending babies, and then they run out of babies. And probably people weren't having babies anymore, or hiding them or getting them out of there. Because what might happen, and, and the only baby now is the king's baby. Okay. And this king, uh, he, he kind of reasons, well, I really don't want to send my baby, but you know, people, people foremost are protective about themselves. So I don't want to, you know, it's either me or the baby, and I'd rather send the baby. Uh, so this is partly where the Buddha starts to kind of tune in on this whole situation because he's, he's in the area and somehow you know, he hears about you know the king's baby is going to go to Alabaca and he wants to do something about it, he just wants the baby to die so uh, and, and also uh, the Buddha has this insight about Alabaca that although he's presently pretty evil, still he has the supporting conditions for changing. I listened to a talk of Bhikkhu Bodhi about this sutta. And, and, um, he says that the Buddha could see a seed of spiritual nobility within this demon, within this person who can see consuming human flesh. So even a demon can change. You know, I, I, by myself, that I am constantly um, cheered uh, that although we human beings get up to all kinds of things, human beings can change. Okay? Sometimes it takes a lot of mud in the eye or awfulness before we change, but human beings can change. And, and Buddhism um, is not cynical about life. It's realistic, but it's not cynical. And it, it sees things, even all the horror and difficulties of the world, is getting better. Um, okay, so let me switch here to, to a bit about Alabaca. So Alabaca um, was a child of a couple who actually um, were attendants to the Buddha before Shakti and the Buddha. I think I'm pronouncing it right, Kasapa. Okay. Um, so they were attendants of this Buddha, meaning they, they must have been um, at least more than likely his, his disciples, his lay disciples. How uh, Avalaka became a demon, I don't know. It doesn't seem to shed light on that. But so his mother and father received these eight questions together with eight answers from Kasapa. Um, and they, they treasured these and, and held on to them, and then they passed them on to their child, Alabaka. Okay. And actually, they, they, they not only passed them on, they, they taught them. They, they taught him the questions and answers. Uh, but then in time, he forgot the answers. I don't know, maybe his parents passed away, you know, maybe he changed the demon. Uh, but he forgot the answers. The thing is, he still had the questions. And he made a list of the questions. And actually, what he was to do in his, sometimes referred to as a mansion, sometimes referred to as a palace, um, he was to put these questions on a sheet of gold and placed them in his palace. So throughout all the years that he turned to being a demon, 
those questions were still there. And these are, of course, the questions that he'll ask the Buddha. Um, so we've got, we've got this story going on with the Buddha uh, and the king's uh, child, who Alavaka could well consume in a day or two. Uh, and, and then we've got Alavaka himself. And as I say, I said earlier, the Buddha realized that, that Alavaka, um, there, there was a seed of something there, there was a chance he could change. So he intentionally goes to Alavaka's palace. And it turns out Alavaka is away. He's, on a, he's in a gathering, convention, whatever, of the Yakshas, Yakas in the Himalayas. Uh, and so when the Buddha approaches Alavaka's house, there's a doorkeeper. And he tries over and over again to put the Buddha off, to get the Buddha, you know, not to come in the house, not to stay around. He explains that Alavaka is like a hot frying pan. Um, he does not have regard for his mother or father. He does not have regard for ascetics or Brahmins, nor does he have regard for the Dharma. Um, when others come here, he drives them insane or splits their hearts or grabs them by the feet and hurls them across the ocean or across the world's sphere. So this guy is not, you know, not a very nice man. But the Buddha, he's just not deterred by this. Because the, the uh, goalkeeper tries again and again to get the Buddha not to stay. But the Buddha's going to stay. That's the way it is. And the Buddha asks basically, can I stay overnight in this mansion? Um, and he does this. Okay, and so Alavaka's off at this... Uh, Demon's Convention, and the Buddha's there in his mansion, and the, the uh, doorkeeper feels that he know, needs to go tell Alavaka what's happening, the Buddha is at his house. And the Buddha says, fine, go tell him. You know, that's what you need to do, go tell him. So somehow the, the doorkeeper gets to uh, the Himalayas, um, and he tells Alavaka uh, about about this. And of course, Alavaka is not happy. He doesn't want anything to do with the Buddha. He wants him out of there. Uh, I think in my rereading of the commentary this morning, what I realized is that Alavaka comes back in, in the night to his mansion. Okay. Um, So he comes, he comes back to the mansion uh, and then he proceeds to use his powers. He refers to them as the nine kinds of storms. So he sends these storms of wind, you know, headed straight for the Buddha, of rain, of stones, of blows, of coals, of ashes, of sand, of metal, <coughs> of darkness. Well, they don't work. You know, they just kind of dissolve or they have any effect on the Buddha. Uh, and then he, he gets out, he gets his, <coughs> his army together, and you know, they're going to antagonize the Buddha, um, and he gets fierce spirits who are going to make all kinds of gestures at the Buddha, basically scare him off. Well, that doesn't work either. So the last tool he has is it's, uh, it's, uh, called the cloth that covers the sky. Okay. Um, he has this cloth that just brings great darkness and you know, surely, <coughs> surely um, you know, it blocks out everything. It's going to send the Buddha away. Well, it, this enormous uh, cloth that covers the sky is turned into a washcloth by the time it gets to the Buddha. And of course, the washcloth is not going to do much at all. So the Buddha is still there. He's still in Alavaka's house. Um, and what, what, what Alavaka comes to, he says that this ascetic dwells in loving kindness. Uh, that's why none of these things work. He's really, he's really uh, 
by this self rooted in loving kindness. There's no hatred there. Okay? So all these things didn't work. So what he figures is, well, maybe I can make him angry um, and deprive him of his loving kindness. So he, he proceeds then to invite the Buddha. Well, actually, the Buddha's already in. He says, get out, the Buddha. And the Buddha goes out outside the door. And then he says, come in to the Buddha. And the Buddha comes in his house. And then he says, get out. And he's just kind of go back and forth, back and forth with this, trying to wear down the Buddha's patience. Well, that's not going to work, as we know. And it doesn't work. And so that's kind of where we start the sutta. What happens, in fact, the next step is Alabaka says to the Buddha that after these trials of patience don't work, he says, um, okay, I'm going to ask you eight questions. Of course, these are the questions that his parents left him that he still had. And he lost the answers. So he's asking the Buddha for, for the answers to these. And he says, if you can't answer me um, satisfactorily, I'm going to chop you up into little pieces and chuck you across the Ganges. And the Buddha says, it's not going to work. And he, just, he says, I don't think there's anyone um, in this universe who can do that to me. So the Buddha is just totally fearless. And this leads to Alavaka asking his questions. So this is pretty fantastic. I mean, I, quite frankly, I don't think Harry Potter, superheroes, <laughs> Star Wars, or any of these things that come out in the next while have anything on this information that we got from the Sutta. And, and the Sutta, the commentary for the Sutta, um, is, is uh, something that was um, pulled together by, I hope I'm saying this right, Buddhaghosa in the 5th century CE in Sri Lanka. So, so what had happened was, with some of the suttas that were passed on, there were also commentaries passed on and then eventually written down. And to fill in some of the blanks on the suttas, you know, this is wonderful. And so they made their way to Sri Lanka, um, with the early mis Buddhist missionaries that came there. And then finally it was Buddha Gosa who really uh, studied them and, and kind of made sense of them. And, and he's pretty, you know, he's pretty well thought of in the Buddhist world. Now personally, I'm not put off by the stuff of the commentary. Fantastic or not, it explains the beginnings of the Sutta. Because, as I say, I just, how did this guy get this way? So I don't think I'm going to read the sutta because I think you all, well, hopefully all read it, and, and if you didn't, you still have the opportunity to. But at this point in the sutta, uh, Alavaka poses four questions, where he gives four answers, he poses another four, the Buddha gives another four answers, and he poses another four, um, and the Buddha gives another four answers. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, I listened to a Dharma talk by Bhikkhu Bodhi, as I said, on the Alabaka Sutta, uh, which he gave when he was visiting Abhayagiri Monastery. So you can find this talk on the Abhayagiri website. And I highly recommend it. Because he can explain the sutta much better than I can. But what he says that in this talk, uh, so those first four questions and the last four questions, he, I think the, the other four are just kind of mixed in there, but he says in these questions in the Alabaka Sutta, they contain the whole of the Buddha's teachings. The whole of the Buddha's teachings are in those eight questions. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, that's pretty good. I mean, this must, must be a pretty good sutta. And it turns out that this sutta in the, Buddha, in the Buddhist world is really highly thought of. And in Thailand, they take pieces of it for wise sayings that are posted throughout the country. And when the country was... was um, celebrating its 200th 
anniversary. Most people in Thailand became unified two hundred years ago. Uh, the king gave gave a talk from this super using this super using these questions. What Bhikkhu Bodhi says is that the first four questions um, are are about mundane aspects of practice. And the second four questions go to the super mundane, um, or, or sometimes we say um, the transcendent teachings. Okay. Um, and also, Bhikkhu Bodhi says that you don't skip to the second four. Okay. You have to start with the first four in practice. You can't ignore the mundane teachings because your practice is rooted in there. And actually, the higher teachings, if you want to call them that, um, come out of those. So mundane teachings mean teachings of this world. Super mundane teachings refer to world transcending. And, and I think Sometimes we want to skip to the world transcending. Um, leave behind the basic stuff and skip to the, the world transcending. It's probably because we're having problems with basic suffering. Um, and I, I don't think it quite works that way. You just don't skip the, the mundane and go to the transcending. You know, even if you have an awakening experience in your practice, you have to come back to ordinary, everyday life. The Buddha himself had vast religious experience and vision, no doubt. And yet he chose to live the simple life of a monk. He taught in all over India for 40 years to all kinds of people. He taught, he taught to this demon. Um, he meditated daily. He carried his alms bowl daily to receive his food. He lived in community with his monks, which was not always easy because the monks um, were beginners. Uh, you know, they were very much in the mundane. Uh, and here's someone who transcended. And yet he, he, he saw the value of living in community. He saw the value um, in creating monasteries that there be this interchange between the lay practitioners and the monastic practitioners. This was vital to everyone's life. Uh, and also, interestingly, the Buddha chose to die in an out-of-the-way place, in a very small place, not well known, in India at that time. I think, you know, actually, I went there when I went to India. It's still a very small, small place in terms of the actual city there. Unfortunately, the, the grounds where the Buddha died are really being taken care of and turned really into a park and, and a historical site. But he didn't want to go to a big city. You know, he just didn't want all kinds of people around him. He just, just wanted to die peacefully. There's a, a teaching of the Buddha called A Handful of Leaves. I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. So in this teaching, the Buddha picks up a handful of leaves and he asks the monks, monks, which is more, the leaves in my hand or the leaves on the trees? So they're in a forest, okay? And, and obviously, there are more leaves on, in the trees than there are in the forest, than there are in his hand. Um, and that's, that's what the monks respond. Of course, they answer, um, what is in the trees is the most. That's where the most leaves are. And the Buddha says, so too much the things I have directly known but not taught you are numerous, while the things I have taught you are few. And why, monks, have I not taught you these many things? Because without benefit, because they are without benefit, irrele irrelevant to the fundamentals of spiritual life. And, and they do not lead to disenchantment, to dispassion, to cessation, to peace to direct knowledge, to enlightenment, to nirvana. And what have I taught you? I have taught you this is suffering, this is the origin of suffering, this is the cessation of suffering, 
This is the way to the cessation of suffering, for noble truths. And why have I taught you this? Because this is beneficial, irre excuse me, relevant to the fundamentals of spiritual life and leads to disenchantment, to passion, to cessation, to peace, to direct knowledge, to enlightenment, to nirvana. So when the, when the Buddha talks about this passion and disenchantment, he doesn't mean we don't care. You know, we're kind of in a state where I don't really care. You know, I'm on a higher plane. Um, you know, and I'm not involved in life. Um, so it doesn't mean we don't care. It mean we don't care about people and the events of life. Okay. I look up the word disenchantment. Well, actually, it means a state free from being taken over by illusion or, or false conception of the way things really are. And this passion is uh, when we let go of emotions and bias. It's that state where in we let go of emotions and bias. Twice in the handful of leaves, the Buddha uses the term fundamentals of spiritual life. We just don't leave behind the fundamentals of this practice and graduate to the special teachings. Yes, sometimes we have a breakthrough, a deep insight, a profound understanding. Yeah, that happens. You know, and it's great. Um, but if you cling to those things and you don't come back down into everyday life, in time they fade, fade, and they just become an experience. And, you know, I've seen people talk to people who are trying to reenact an experience, a lovely experience a spiritual experience that they had in their life. And I felt very sad for them because I don't think you can do that. You know, my life moves on. Life moves on. And yes, these insights, these understanding, these experiences help us in our training. They're, they're good things to remember, especially when training darkens a bit for us. The uh, very famous uh, Buddhist author, Daisen Suzuki, said, once or twice there are the great moments, and I'm paraphrasing this, and then there are the thousand little moments that make us dance. So it's all there in everyday life. The most basic, simple teaching uh, springboards us as well as fully contains um, the seemingly most profound and intricate teaching. In many of the teachings the Buddha gave to Alavaka, it reminds me of the exchange with the Kalamas. Okay? Because in the first four questions, uh, the first four questions, it's kind of how he took the Kalamas through the paces and then let them walk on their own. Um, so when we, we come to Buddhism, uh, we are both seeking, and there is an intuitive knowledge that there is an order to the universe. That we are part of it. Our actions have effect. There is a moral order to the universe. It, one of the first things that, that began to propel me into uh, looking into Buddhism was when I took a, an astronomy class in college. I was a sophomore. Unfortunately, I missed a lot of it because I had knee surgery. But, um, but the bit that I was able to attend, um, it both pointed to the vastness of the universe, to the order of the universe, and to the impermanence that was constantly playing out in the universe. And, and you know, I mean, I, I'm sure I kind of knew this in life, but, but I just didn't really think about it. Okay? So... I think there is this intuitive knowledge about an order of the universe, and also that there's a moral order to life. Um, you know, as the Buddha brought the Kalamas through those questions about what happens if you do this, you know, is this the consequence you would like or not like? Um, I think this kind of reasoning, you know, comes up for us in life. Wise teachings, that's teachings of the Dharma, or 
wise teachings, you can say, have to be practiced to be of any good. Okay? You, can, you can read all the teachings, you can read all the suttas, um, you can memorize them. But if you don't put them into practice in your everyday existence, you're missing something. Truth initially has a bitter, sweet taste, especially if we are in denial of it. But as we let it come in more, it's sweet. Okay? Um, because we can see, oh yes, there's truth. You know, there's something more than I thought there was. There's something bigger than me. We, become, we find truth and practice, if we find truth and practice in our, it in our life, life becomes less of a burden. Anjan Cha uh, refers to the, to the meditative life as still flowing water. I really, I really like that. Okay? If you look at a stream, if you walk along a stream, sometimes there's these pools that just seem to be sitting there, and yet there's water going into them and water going out of them. But there's this stillness about them. And I think this is true uh, for us in practice. One crosses the flood of views by faith in, a, in that there is a truth, that there is a better way within all the confusion. Okay, So this this flood of stuff that the, the Kalamas had put upon them by all these ascetics who had come through, well, I think they still knew there was something beyond that. And, you know, fortunately, the Buddha came along and, and listening to him, they, they, made, they made, started to make jumps in their understanding of this. One crosses the sea of samsara by being aware of what causes suffering and what leads to peace, harmony, and happiness. Suffering is a strong current. If you want to think of it in terms of a river, if you want to think of it in terms of an ocean, it's got mighty waves. Okay? We need to be steadfast and energetic in our training to stay on top of the water, to be able to um, keep afloat. The wisdom that we gain in practice calms the mind and the heart. To really penetrate wisdom, I think it really ha- helps to grow confidence in the Dharma. Okay? Uh, and this is what we saw in the Kalama Sutra. You know, by the end, they had grown confidence in the Buddha and the Dharma, and they, they wanted to be part of his Sangha. Living from wisdom brings us uh, to true, lasting wealth. And that wealth is a wealth in which we abide in the teachings of the Buddha. Okay. Let me go back a minute here. So I hope this is making sense. Okay. So I think this, this sutta has really good advice, um, which obviously the Buddha gives fearlessly. You know, he's, he's just, he's not afraid of Alavaka, with all this stuff and threats and the fact that he's doesn't, if the Buddha doesn't give answers, he's going to chop them up and toss them across the Ganges. Um, well, probably most of us don't meet a person, probably, hopefully, most of us don't meet a person like Alavaka in our life. Um, you know, we, we meet some tough people, but I don't think quite Alavaka. Uh, one thing we all know is the convincing power of greed, hate, and delusion. We all know the strength of craving and desire. We all know how hard it is sometimes to keep the precepts in detail. Because there's the precepts and there's the precepts in detail, meaning that we have to really get in there and study them. You know, as we were discussing yesterday, uh, there are some issues in life that are not black and white. So just a black and white knowledge of the precepts, well, it's not enough sometimes. We've got to go deeper, okay? Got to go deeper. Study them in detail. 
Faith in Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha is a person's best treasure. Okay? It's, it's the person's best treasure. It's the person's best wealth. Quite frankly, I think it's the person's best chance. Um, the Dharma well practiced brings happiness. A life of truth brings a real sweetness to existence. Because, because we're not suffering anymore the way, the way we were. You know, we realize that there, there is a sweetness to existence with all its difficulties and all its problems. You know, it said the human life is the greatest opportunity to find nirvana. Because we've got suffering staring us right in our face, pretty much from the time of birth. Ignorance is at the root of suffering. When we convert ignorance to wisdom by living the teachings of the Buddha, the struggle has been lifted from our life. And even though the mountains of aging and death are pressing in on us, there is an unhindered joy. Okay? We're not suffering anymore. By energy, one overcomes suffering. So energy is one of the paramitas, the ways to the other shore. We have to apply ourselves to the practice for it to work. It's just not magic, you know. As I said before, you can read all the books you want about Buddhism, but it's getting in there and practicing it where the real crux of the matter is. Um, in terms of the practice, no one can do it for us. But when we gather our energy and step into the practice, we in fact see that there's all this help. You know, Although we have to do it for ourselves, there's all this aid to help us. One gains wisdom from a desire to learn if one is... Read that again. One gains wisdom from a desire to learn if one is heedful and astute. Again, doors open if we put our nose to the grindstone and we put effort into the difficult areas of our practice because it's easy to put effort in the easy matters of training. It's the more difficult ones that we also have to put the effort into. Wisdom is not power. Wisdom comes from the practice of charity, tenderness, benevolence and sympathy, or giving, endearing speech, beneficent conduct, and impartiality. True wealth has little to do with vast sums of money. Obviously, we need some money in life to live responsibly, to live securely, and that's a good thing. But vast sums of money, unless used wisely, they can be a curse. And truth lives on, okay? Um, with all the foolishness in the world, truth lives on. Falsehood cannot last. Generosity naturally leads to lasting friendship. This is, you know, a number of these things are the, the answers to the questions that Alabaka posed to the Buddha. And generosity needs last, to lasting friendship is one of those. Because when we're generous, we make room in ourselves. You know, we make room for sympathy and benevolence towards all, benevolence towards all beings. Um, when we're stingy, miserly, tight, there's no room. Okay, um, and the, the beings in the six worlds, the universe. Although it's knocking on our door, there's no room. Faithful seeking of the householder life, excuse me, the, the faithful seeker of the household life who possesses these four qualities, truth, dhamma, steadfastness, generosity, does not sorrow when they pass on. So at the end of this sutta, alavaka is, is changed. Okay? And the Buddha says to him, he says, you know, I've given you these answers. Please go, go out and check them with anybody you want, you know, any of the great teachers of the day and, and the ascetics um, to see if they are good answers. And Alavaka 
says the Buddha, he says, I'm not going to do that. I don't need to do that. I'm actually going to go from town to town now and, and, and basically sing the praises of the Buddha because you've, you've changed my life. So I have to believe here that he is no longer a demon at this point of the sutta. And, you know, this, the sutta was good enough for Alavaka. So I think it has something as well in it f- for all of us, okay? And I think if we look back in our life, we can say, well, actually, we were quite similar to Alavaka. Maybe uh, we lost the answers to the questions. Maybe we even lost the questions. Um, But when we have the opportunity to sit still and reflect, when we we are, um, well, when we come in contact with wise people, when we come in contact with the teachings of the Buddha, there's questions and there's answers. And, And like the Kalamas, you know, the Buddha helps lead us there, but we're the ones who make the leap. I was going to end this by a paraphrase from Amazing Grace, but quite frankly, I don't even know if my paraphrase is accurate at all. But what once was lost, now is found. What once was bound, now is free. And I think that that's what the Buddha's teachings can do for us. They can set us free. Thank you. Homage to all the Buddhas in all the world. Homage to all the Bodhisattvas in all the world. Homage to the scripture of great wisdom.